So now that you've learned about condition object structure and functionality, you know the key methods of which there are really just three that matter, uh, weight, uh, a weight, signal, and signal all. Let's show how this stuff is actually used in practice. And this is a fairly involved discussion, so we'll look at it from a couple different points of view. And we'll be focusing on the array blocking queue. So uh, as you probably recall, because we talked about this last week, array blocking queue is a blocking bounded FIFO queue that's implemented by an array, as the name implies. It extends the abstract queue superclass. It implements the blocking queue interface that has methods take and put, among other things. And we're going to focus on both the interface and the implementation of the blocking queue. And I'll show you how it's implemented and how it gets used. So internally, the array is implemented with a dynamically sized uh, built-in array, and, which is called items. And then we also have some other state, some fields, take index and put index. This object state must be protected from race conditions, which kind of implies Brantford lock, right? And we also need to use that state to coordinate the put and take calls. So things like what's the current count and so on will be relevant there too. I guess I should probably have put count, counts also one of the things in here as well. Um, in addition, we also have some synchronizers. We have a Rantrant lock and two condition objects. And this is used to protect the object state from race conditions and also to coordinate everything. We talked about the use of Rantrant lock in our previous lesson on Rantrant lock. So I won't spend a whole lot of time on that here unless you have any questions about it. It's really straightforward, though. The condition objects are our focus now. And these are used, we have two of them, to separate waiting consumers, things that are trying to take stuff from the queue, and producers, things that are trying to put things into the queue. And the reason for doing that is to reduce the amount of redundant wake-ups and checking that's necessary. It simplifies the code sub substantially relative to trying to, to use a built-in monitor object, which only has one condition. Here's the constructor. It takes the capacity, which is going to be the number of uh, elements here, so the, the, the elements that we've got uh, in the array of objects. And we have a fair parameter, which controls the order in which groups of threads can call methods on the queue. Um, this is a very subtle thing. So you might want to read the documentation for array blocking queue to understand the semantics of fair. The most important thing that fair does is it says whether or not the reentrant lock will have fair semantics. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, what this means is if you want a fair blocking queue, it means that threads that block on insertion or removal for the reentrant lock will queue up in FIFO order on the lock. If you say false, then the order is not specified. There'll be whatever order the operating system and virtual machine and hardware deems the right one. Now, once we've got ourselves a lock, we then go ahead and use that lock and its new condition factory method to make not empty and not full condition objects. So we use the lock to make these objects. And that's always the way things work. Remember, condition object is always associated with the lock. How do we ensure that? We make sure we have a factory method that returns a condition object that is associated with that lock by virtue of the fact the condition object is created by the lock's factory method. So it can decide how it's going to be associated. All right, so that's kind of the high level view. Now let's kind of delve a little bit into the, the details. And I'm going to visualize a lot of this stuff, because in my experience, it's a little complicated to just look at code. So we're going to use this diagram. And this is uh, sort of the monitor object notation. And I'll explain all these different things. Rentrant lock and condition object, the two condition objects, are used to implement the monitor object pattern. And the monitor object pattern, as part of it, uses the guarded suspension pattern. So there's lots of, lots of pattern density here. You can read about the monitor object pattern here. That's something I wrote up. It's been around for a long time. But I wrote the pattern, and it appeared in the POSA 2 book. So you might want to take a look at that. And this pattern synchronizes method execution to ensure only one method at a time runs in an object's critical section. And it allows the object's methods to cooperatively schedule their execution. So that's a Nice pithy definition of what the monitor object pattern is. So we're going to visualize all this stuff using this diagram. So the first thing we're going to look at is let's assume, for sake of argument, someone's made 
a block in queue, and it's empty. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a block in queue with, let's say, a maximum capacity of 10. So that means there's up to 10 items that could be in it before it becomes full. And then thread T1 calls take on that queue. And of course, what that's going to do is it's going to block. Um, and uh, that will then give us a chance to look at what happens under the hood. So when we call take, the queue is initially empty, so we're going to block. Here is what take looks like. Here's the code. Here's the diagram. So when take is called, the first thing it's going to do, as we'll see in a second, is it's going to try to acquire the lock. So thread T1 is going to come and try to get the lock. And it's going to do that. And it's going to get inside the, um, well, actually, it, we call take. And so we get in here. And we're going to try to acquire the lock. So when we do lock interruptibly, which means we can interrupt it, of course. That means we can enter into the critical section. So here, you know, it's kind of in its ante room. Now it acquires the lock and comes into the critical section. And the reason it does that, there's no other threads trying to get in there, so we get exclusive access. So we're in good shape so far. We then use the guarded suspension pattern to wait until the queue is not empty. So this is the guarded suspension stuff we talked about when we discussed an earlier part of this lesson. And what it's saying is, while the count is 0, we're going to wait. Well, it is 0, right? Because there's nothing in it. So this condition is true, but the condition we're waiting for, which is count greater than 0, is not satisfied. So we have to wait. So what happens, and, and watch this. Notice here we're running in the critical section. And then when we call await, we go into this little waiting room, literally, and we're now queued up waiting on the not empty condition. So we moved out of the critical section into this little waiting room. And that will atomically release the lock and go to sleep. So this thread will block and go to sleep and release the lock. So the lock is now available. Someone else can come through. And we're kind of parked off to the side in this waiting area. All right, so that's take. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. We're in take. So here we are. Thread T1 is blocked, waiting for the queue to become not empty. Another thread comes along, and it's going to call put. So we have a new string. We put the string in there. T1 is blocked. T2 wants to put something in there. Well, what happens is we call put. It enters the monitor object. We're able to acquire the lock, because let's say, for sake of argument, there's nobody else who's waiting on the lock. This guy's waiting on the condition object, but not the lock. So we come in, get inside the critical section. And now we say, while the count equals the number of items in the queue, well, or in the, the array. The array is empty, so the, 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 the length of the thing is like you know, 10, because we set it to 10. But the count is 0, because we don't have anything in there. So this condition is going to be satisfied, so we're not going to have to wait. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to call insert to try to insert this element that the caller wants to put into the array blocking queue. Here's what insert looks like. Insert is actually not synchronized, because the expectation is it's called with the lock held. And that's something that's actually called the thread safe interface pattern, which is another pattern from my POSA 2 book. This method updates the state of the queue. It adds the element into the put index, increments the put index, perhaps wrapping it, and increments the count by 1. And then it signals the not empty condition says, hey, if there's somebody who's waiting, oh, and by the way, there is somebody who's waiting, says if anybody's waiting, you can try to wake up and see if you can make forward progress at this point. I'm not going to give you any guarantees, but the, world's, the state of the world may have changed to be something more to your liking. So what will happen here is this guy is going to start you know, kind of revving his engine and warming back up again once he's signaled. Right? But that, we're going to talk about that in a second. In the meantime, here's the remaining of the code. Inserts come back. We're in the finally block. We're going to unlock the lock. And that will cause us to leave the monitor. So we're now no longer in the monitor at all, which means the lock has been released again. All right. So now, let's say this guy here had been blocked. But now he's been signaled. So now he's got a green light. So he's able to come back into the monitor 
And now he gets to see if he can get access to the lock. So remember, await does two things. It, 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 it does multiple things. It blocks and releases the lock when it is first called. And then when someone signals it, the await implementation will wake up and then have to go and reacquire the lock it's associated with. In this case, the reentrant lock that was part of this class. So let's assume for sake of argument, we can reacquire that lock because nobody else has it at this point. Now this guy is up and running again, and it will loop back around and recheck the count. Well, if you just noticed, when we called put, the count went up by one. So now, while count equals zero is false, so the condition is satisfied, right? We can now, we can pass. We're no longer the Balrog, right? We can get through. And at this point, we will then call the extract method. We're in the critical section. The extract method is called extract, assumes it's called with locks held. It's a thread safe interface pattern again. And it goes ahead and takes the item out of the, um, the element. And then it goes ahead and sets the element to null, increments the take index, decrements the count, and signals anybody waiting for the queue to be not full, because we just took something out of it. There was nobody who was not full, but there might have been. Um, and then we return the value of x. That comes back here, which will be the return value from take. And since we have a try finally block, the last thing we do is release the lock. And that lets us out of the monitor object. So again, a nice visualization, you know, side by side showing what's going on with the code, showing on the, what's going on with the equivalent visualization of the various elements in the monitor object using the monitor object syntax, visual syntax. Now, why is this complicated? It's complicated because there's all these different moving parts, right? We've got this monitor lock. We've got these conditions here, not empty, not full. We can await, we can signal, they have to coordinate. So it can be complicated. So that's the thing to remember. It's, it takes some doing. Now, the good news is it's always pretty much done in exactly the same way. So once you get accustomed to seeing it work, it's kind of paint by numbers at that point. And you'll learn that when you do the simple semaphore assignment in assignment 2B.